right, so here in chapter three, we're going to focus in on the microscope and microscopy. We're also going to be looking at staining and different things like that. So as we start with chapter three, metric units are used for measurement in science classes. And one thing with this is, is it's because it's a standardized way to measure. It's also very easy because it is going to be in powers of 10. So it's really easy to do 10 times 10 times 10, that sort of thing, because you just move the decimal. Um, this helps with converting from one unit to another, and it makes it very easy. So an example, here it shows you one centimeter is going to be 10 millimeters. You move the decimal just one time. But since we're looking at microorganisms, we're going to be looking at the fact that they're super small. They're smaller than a centimeter, a lot of times smaller than millimeters. And so we're going to see that we're going to use two other types of measurement. One is called the micrometers. Micrometers are a millionth of a meter. So this is 10 to the negative six. And then there's also nanometers. Nanometers are a billionth of a meter. So it's 10 to the negative nine. So when we look at this, guys, we see that a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter and a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. And that's why these are going to be even smaller than that. All right. And so when you're looking on the microscope, a lot of times it may have like a little ruler on it. And that's for your um, micrometers or nanometers. So when we look at microscopes, a quick review, we talked about this back in the um, overview chapter in chapter one. But remember that Robert Hooke was one of the main scientists who used the compound scope to study cells. He was the first one to coin the term cell. We also see Leeuwenhoek in the 17th century used one lens, a simple microscope to magnify um, the little structures found in like uh, stream water or, or lake water, uh, pond water. With his simple microscope, he was able to magnify them 300 times so he could see that they were moving around and that's why he called them little animals or animalcules. So the types of microscopes um, that we want to look at are gonna be characteristic based on their energy source. They're going to be put into groups based on if their energy source is a light, if it's photons, acoustic, electron, or like a scanning type probe. Um, the ones that we use in the lab is going to be the light microscope. In some places you may have access to electron microscopes if you go to a larger type of university, um, but we are going to take a look at these different types of microscopes. So we're going to look at light microscopy first, and the one we're going to look at is what we would call just the bright filled uh, light microscope. This is where the specimen is light against a bright background. Um, you can use a wet mount or a stained prep using this type of microscope. When you use a wet mount, you can't stain it, but it does allow you to be able to view motility and movement, um, whereas the stained would have to be a fixed specimen on a slide that could be stained to be able to see structures maybe a little bit easier. In the lab, the compound light microscope is what we would use with the bright filled illumination. You do need to learn the parts and their functions. Um, this is looked at in, in some of your um, lab components, but when we look here, you wanna make sure that you can see the um, eyepieces that are located here. You also have the revolving um, nose piece that has the different objective lenses. Each of those objectives are going to give us different amounts of magnification, making them larger and larger. We also have the light source. Here's going to be the this is why it's called a light microscope because the light source is down here. You can adjust the light uh, based on how much light comes through through the diaphragm and the condenser. Um, these are located right underneath the stage. The stage is where the slide will be placed. Um, one thing to note when we look at this, the um, the eyepieces normally magnify um, the image 10 more times. So you would do 10 times whatever number is found on the um, objective that you're using on the nose piece. So if the objective is a four on the nose piece, you would do four times 10 to equal your 40 um, magnification. If it was 100 times on the objective, you do 100 times 10, which would say it would magnify it 1,000 times. All right, and so that's how you end up seeing how much you're actually magnifying um, the object that you're looking at. We also see with the light microscopy, there's the dark field. When we look at the dark field, this is where the specimen um, is light against a dark background. So instead of a bright background, it has a dark background to it. A lot of times you can use wet mounts with this too, again, to watch and look at motility and movement and being able to see if they use flagella, cilia, um, how the organism moves in their environment. If you look here, when you go into um, the modules, this PowerPoint is available. There is a video that shows you um, how syphilis, which is a spirochete, moves. Um, so it gives you an idea of what the dark filled microscope kind of looks like when we're detecting motility. Another light microscope that we want to look at is called the phase contrast. 
It uses filters to alter the light, um, how it's going to be refracted and diffracted, meaning like how the light is bent to be able to be used. Again, you can use a wet prep with this. Um, it allows internal structures to be, be viewed in a little more um, uh, detail. So when we look here on this particular side, I kind of give you a comparison. So you have the bright filled, you have the dark filled, and then you have the phase contrast. And these are all of the exact same organism, but in each of these different types of microscopes, it to be able to focus in on different types of structures. Another type of light microscope that is important that we can use is uh, fluorescence. This is going to be using ultraviolet light sources like a black light. Um, they can view fluorescent um, against a dark background. So again, this would be kind of like a dark field in a sense that it's using a dark background. But you guys have to use a special kind of stain in order to get it to glow, okay, to be able to be seen on that black background. Um, some are naturally fluorescent so that some organisms you don't have to use the stain for, but a lot of them you would have to stain them. Some stains employ a type of tag. This is a tagged antibody that specifically targets an antigen or a, a protein that's found on the organism. This helps us be able to identify certain organisms versus others based on what kind of markers are found on their uh, cell membranes or cell walls. So it allows us to be able to tag it. So here's an example with the fluorescent microscope. Now the other group of microscopes we're really going to kind of talk about are the electron microscopes. With the electron microscope, this microscope allows us to have a very high resolution, being able to magnify and be able to actually see detail a lot better than our light microscope can. There's two main types of electron microscopes. The first are called the transmission electron microscopes, um, or TEMs. This is going to be able to look at stained internal structures, but it kills the organism in the process. This allows us to magnify the organism 10,000 to 100,000 times larger than it really is. We also see there's the scanning electron microscope or the SEM. This allows you to view 3D structures on like the surfaces. This one doesn't magnify as um, great as the TEM, but it does allow you to be able to see the external structures in a lot of detail. It magnifies about 1,000 to 10,000 times. All right, so if you look here in these two pictures, this bottom one with the black background is for a transmission. Um, is for the transmission electron microscope, so it allows you to be able to see the internal structures, whereas the scanning over here allows you to be able to look more at the 3D shape. It allows you to look at the 3D structures that are present. So there's a number of questions that need to be asked. The first is, what are you studying? Okay, this allows us to look at if it's if it's super small, um, if you would need to use high magnification. There's a lot of different things that we would look at for that. This also brings us to the next question. It says, does the organism need to be living? If it needs to be living, this is gonna determine what kind of wet mount um, slides you can use and what kind of scopes are available. On the other hand, do you need it stained so that you can see the structures? Okay, this will lead to other microscopes that could be used. How much magnification do you need? How large do you need it to be um, to be able to see the structures? But another thing that's important to know is the resolution. What's the resolution? Now, resolution is going to be important because this is where you can magnify something, but we want to be able to be able to see detail and not be fuzzy. So when we look at this, we have like, I show you a picture here of a boot. If you take this and you just magnify it with not good resolution, you can see that it's bigger, but it doesn't give you more detail. You still can't really tell what you're looking at, okay? And so we need to make sure whatever microscope we're using does have a very good resolution. So when we look at resolution, this is the ability of the lens to distinguish fine detail and structure in a very close proximity. It gives you the two points to be able to see that there's a certain distance apart, but we still can see details. So what types of microscopes would we use to study the following? So if we take a look here, if you're looking at like macromolecules, and we talked about these in the chemistry chapter, these would be things like fats, proteins, carbohydrates, things like that. You would have to pretty much use an electron microscope. Viruses is kind of the same thing. Most viruses you're going to have to use an electron microscope due to their size. They're pretty small. Um, when we move on up into bacteria and protozoa, you can actually use the light microscopes. Um, fungi and and um, worms or from Animalia, a lot of times these can be seen with the naked eye. However, you may want to look at more detailed structures using the light microscope with these as well. So this brings us to staining. When we're looking at the fact of um, wanting to see structures of an organism in a lot of detail, a lot of times we may need to stain these organisms in order to be able to see them. And so with staining, there's a couple of different things that we want to look at. And before we get to the actual types of stains, let's talk a little bit about what a wet prep or wet mount is. 
What we do with a wet prep or a wet mount is you take the slide, you put a droplet of water with the specimen, and then you cover it with a cover slip. You're not going to use any stain in this because a lot of times the stain would potentially kill the organisms. And so when we're looking at a wet mount, we're looking at the idea of is there any mobility or motility to the organism. This is a very quick and easy way to be able to observe organisms, and it does allow us to detect motility. There are some disadvantages, though, to a wet prep or wet mount. There's no permanent record and so uh, when you get done viewing this and you clean off the slide the organism is gone it's also very difficult to see very detailed structures because of the fact that they're not stained and so because of this it's hard to see some of the internal structures of these organisms so this is why a lot of times we need to add color to these specimens and a stain may need to be used to be able to actually see these um, organisms in more detail Again, here in this PowerPoint, if you pull it up in Canvas, you'll be able to watch the video of the motility here on this slide. Now, can you use an oil objective when you are viewing a wet mount? This is a really good question. The oil objective allows you to be able to magnify things to a greater degree, um, but when we're looking at oil objectives, it's very hard to use them here in a wet prep. And the reason is, is that it's not common practice because if the oil is used, the slide has to be sealed. When you put the oil, remember oil Oil and water don't mix, and so because of this, it does make it difficult in order to utilize um, the oil objective when we're using the wet prep or wet mount. So before we can actually stain a slide, we need to prepare the slide in order to make sure that our specimens hopefully don't get washed off as we're staining them. All right, so this is what we call, we're going to prepare a smear. All right, so when you look at preparing a smear, you're going to mix a small amount of the specimen in a drop of sterile water. Now we want to use sterile water so that nothing else is potentially in the water so that we can focus in solely on the organism that we are wanting to see. We also could potentially use a drop if the organism is found in broth. You can just use the broth as the drop. Now, another thing that's really important here is once you've placed it on the slide, you need to let it air dry. This doesn't mean you need to blow on it or anything like that because that could potentially add bacteria or contamination from your mouth, but you just need to let it air dry. Once it is completely air dried, you want to then heat fix it. This heat fixing kills and sticks the specimen to the slide. Now, there's a number of ways that you can heat fix a slide. Um, if you have a Bunsen burner, like in this particular picture, you could wave it over it to heat fix it. Also, if you have an incinerator, um, if they were using those in the lab, you would just hold the, the slide up against the incinerator and heating that surface. Now, one thing to note, though, is that glass does get hot here, and so you wouldn't want to use your bare hand. A lot of times you would have instruments and stuff to help you be able to do this. Now, before you actually stain the slide, it's also very important that the slide cools completely. So you want to make sure that you heat fix it, but then you want the slide to cool completely. Okay, once it's cooled completely, then the smear is ready for us to stain. That way the organisms have been killed, we can now stain them and be able to look at their structures. Now, there are several sources of air that can come into play when we're looking at preparing smears or looking in with stained organisms. One is that the smear could be too thick. You get too many organisms on the slide and this makes it where they are stacked on top of each other and it doesn't allow the light to come through for you to be able to see the details. Another source of air is when you heat fix the smear, um, before it's dry. Um, if you don't let it air dry and then you try to heat fix it and let it dry um, using the heat, that could potentially um, alter your organism's structures. You also want to make sure that you don't heat fix it too long. If you heat fix it too long, then the cells can get distorted and misshapen. And again, that makes it hard for you to identify what kind of organism you are looking at. All right, so this brings us to our stain. So when we're looking at stains, there are what we would consider basic dyes that we can use to stain these bacteria or these organisms. One thing that they use on this is their positive ions, and so it helps them stick to the surface. We also see that there can be acidic dyes. Acidic dyes are going to use negative ions. So if you'll notice, positive and negative, they're opposite. And so when we look at this, bacteria especially, when we look at their cell walls, they're slightly negative in charge when they are at a 
pH of 7. And when you're using sterile water, that's the pH we're looking at. This allows us to see that the basic dyes would actually be better here because since they have a slightly negative charge, they are going to be attracted to the positive ions on the basic dye. Okay, the acidic dyes, since they're negative, would end up causing them to repel each other. All right, so it does deter, we do need to kind of determine which dyes we might want to use. Now, which type of dye is better for a bacterial cell wall? Of course, this would be a basic dye due to the charges. Positive charges will be attracted to the negative charge of the cell wall of the bacteria. Now, there are many common basic dyes that are available. Um, these are some ones that are very common to be used in labs. One is methylene blue, crystal violet, uh, saffronin, and the malachite green. So there's different types depending on which structures you're wanting to look at, potentially what dyes you might utilize. Now, these obviously give different colors, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these a little later. So when we are staining organisms, there's a couple of ways that we can stain it that could be useful. And one is called a simple stain. The purpose of a simple stain is to determine the shape and arrangement of the cells. It's to allow us to see what shape we have, whether it's bacillus, caucus, um, spirillium, and it also lets us look to see in the fact if they are in clusters, if they're in strings, um, all of those different things. Um, a very common simple stain that is used is the methylene blue. All right, it's normal normally used here and this shows you two examples. Um, this one over here is the staph. You can see that it's more in a, it's a staphylococcus. You can see that it's a circular shaped organism, but you also see that it's kind of in clusters. On the other hand over here for the E. coli, again it's stained with this methylene blue which gives it a blue color, but these are more rod shaped. Okay, so these are going to be a bacillus type of bacteria. Another thing we want to look at is what we call differential stains. Differential stains are going to take more steps in order to stain your specimens, but with a differential stain, it's going to allow you to distinguish between different types of bacteria. One of the most common differential stains that is used in a microbiology lab is the Gram reaction or the Gram stain. This allows us to be able to put bacteria into one of two groups. They are either Gram positive or they are Gram negative negative. So when we look at this, the gram stain is most commonly used in um, the initial IDing of a bacteria. Again, letting us know if it's a gram positive versus a gram negative. And this is how the staining process works. You've already heat fixed your smear. Your smear is, is cooled and you're ready to start the process of staining. You then take the crystal violet. You flood the slide with the crystal violet and you let it set for approximately a minute. You then rinse the water or you then rinse the crystal violet off with water. Then you take the iodine. Now the iodine you're going to stick on for a minute and one thing important about the iodine is it's what we call a mordant. It's going to help either hold on to the primary stain or get the cell ready to be able to take the secondary stain. Then of course you would rinse it off with water. Then we're going to use our decolorizer. In this case the decolorizer is 95% ethanol. Um, this one is very critical on the timing. You do not want to over decolorize if that makes sense. If you put it on there and you leave it on for too long, it will actually take all the color out of the cells. So we want to put it on there and we want to get it off pretty quickly. So this is only going to be for seconds. Then you're going to use a secondary stain. The secondary stain is the counter stain and this is going to be the saffronin. This is going to sit again for about a minute and then you're going to rinse it off with the water. Once you rinse it off with the water, then you are going to blot it dry. It is important not to actually wipe it dry because you don't want to wipe the bacteria off your slide, but we want to blot it dry. And again, in some of your labs, you have some videos that go over how to do gram stain, and you also have a video here that shows you how gram stain, how the gram staining process works. So we talked about how these bacteria can be put into one of two groups, whether they're gram positive or they're gram negative. If it is considered a gram positive bacteria, the color will appear purple when you look at it under the microscope. The reason it's purple is that its cell wall takes in the crystal violet, which is the primary stain. This is because it has a thicker layer of peptidoglycan. Okay, so the crystal violet stays, and that's why you see it in the purple color. So during decolorization, it does not get removed. 
if the cell is considered gram negative, it's going to have a pink color. The reason for this is it has a thinner layer of peptidoglycan and it has more of a lipopolysaccharide layer. This means the crystal violet does not stay um, in the cell wall like it would if it was a gram positive. And when it's decolorized, it removes the crystal violet and then we see that the counter stain, the saffron is what stays. And this is what causes it to have that pink or reddish color. All right, so if you take a look here, what we've done in this particular um, set of pictures is you can see how each step is being accomplished. So you look at step one, this is the application of the crystal violet, you put the purple dye on. After the primary stain is added, the first step is done, you can see that the color of the gram positive and the gram negative bacteria would both be purple. So if you look in the picture, they're both purple. After the mordant and decolorizer step, so step two and three, you can then see that the colors start to change a little bit. If it is gram positive, it stays purple. But if it is gram negative, you'll notice that now it is colorless. It does not have a color. It did not hold on to the crystal violet. So now we're ready for the counter stain. When we place the counter stain on and it's been added, then we want to see what color each of these are. If it is still gram positive, it's going to stay purple. But if it's gram negative, this is where we see the red or pink color that's present. So this shows you how the gram stain works. So if we take a look here, um, this shows you some, some slides that are looking at gram positive versus gram negative. So in this first one, you can see that we have a gram negative bacillus. You can see it's the pinkish color. The bacillus means that it's a rod shape. On this same, same slide, you can also see that there's some gram positive bacillus. We still have a rod shaped structure, but these are obviously purple. On the second slide, we see that there is the gram positive because it's purple in color. However, in this particular case, these bacteria are cocci, meaning that they are circular or round. We also see on this slide that there's also a gram negative bacteria, but this gram negative bacteria is a bacillus. It's the rod shape that's present. Now this last slide over here kind of creates a problem. It's hard to tell whether it's pink or purple. Is this going to be a gram variable bacillus, meaning that it has a variable type of cell wall, and so because of that you can't tell if it's gram positive or negative? Is it because these were old cells? Did the person over decolorize or did they under decolorize? It's hard to tell. And so because of this, this is why it's so important to get those steps of the gram stain in, uh, done correctly, but also to make sure that your cells are not super old or you haven't heat fixed them too long because this is what brings up some of those sources of error. So another type of differential stain that could be done is called the acid fast stain. This is also known as the zeal Neeson stain or the um, Kenyon cold method chemical mordant stain. Um, these are going to be used to ID a special kind of bacteria, which are called the mycobacterium. An example of mycobacterium is tuberculosis or TB. Okay, um, and some other what we call nocardia species. They will also do the acid fast uh, stain. And so they'll be acid fast we call positive. So if we look here, you'll notice that we still have a series of steps that are going to take place. You have a primary stain, you have a mordant, you have a decolorizer, and then you have a counter stain. We see it's the exact same kind of sequence we saw with gram staining. We're just going to use different types of chemicals. So if we look here, you can see that there's the application of the uh, carblo fusion type of stain. This is the primary stain, which gives it this nice arm, this nice pink color. Then we see that the mordant here is not a chemical like we saw in the gram stain. It's actually where we're going to use heat. Since it's the mordant, the heat, it can drive the stain into a microorganism that has a high lipid content to its cell um, wall. We then see that after the mordant and we do the decolorizer, this decolorizer is an acid alcohol. This is why it's called the acid fast stain because it's using the acid alcohol there. This is going to decolorize the non-acid fast bacteria. The ones who are acid fast will remain the pink color. Then we're going to use the application of a counter stain and in this case it's methylene blue. The methylene blue then will be picked up by the non-acid fast bacteria. So the principle here is that microbes with a high lipid or what we call a mycolic acid content, they will actually retain the carbofusion uh, colored stain um, 
even after the acid alcohol has washed over it. And so the acid did not wash away the primary stain. Now, there's also some special stains that could be used. Um, the purpose um, for these special stains may be used to look at a bacterial, a specific bacterial structure. So one example of this is using a negative stain. Negative stains could be something like Indian ink. Um, these are going to detect capsules located on the outer portion of the cell wall of bacteria. This is a simple staining technique, but it does allow you to see if there's a capsule around it. And you can see them located here in this picture. Another one is an endospore stain. When we look at the endospore stain, endosporms help protect bacteria from adverse environments. It actually lets the bacteria kind of go into a dormant phase where it can survive in times when there's not enough food or resources or things like that. Um, this is gonna show you where the endospore is a different color. Um, this is again a differential stain though because you can see there's the two different colors present. The next one is the uh, flagellar stain. This is going to be able to look for flagella, allowing the flagella to be stained to be able to detect motility. Remember, flagella is like a tail that allows for movement of the bacteria. And in a lot of cases, a lot of these bacteria may have multiple flagella present. All these structures that these special stains actually detect, they are factors that help the bacteria be more pathogenic, or what we call saying the bacteria has more virulence, meaning that it can infect you easier. It allows it to make you sick. These are things that helps it do its job, helps it get inside of you, helps it be able to um, attach to your cells or something like that. All right, so that's what these are called pathogenic factors. And we will talk more about these in some future chapters. All right, so that concludes chapter three over the main parts of the microscope. You will be looking a lot at the stain stuff when you get to lab four.